Good evening, I'm Mike Kinetter. Welcome to the UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the UW community talking about various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. The pandemic has impacted daily life all over the world, but urban areas and those who live in them have seen some of the greatest impacts of the pandemic. And of course, that leaves us to wonder what will it all be like when life returns to normal, whatever that might be. Well, we've got three W experts who will discuss how COVID-19 has shaped and impacted cities and what we might expect to see in the future. Paul Robbins is the Dean of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Tim Riddio is Professor and Chair in the Department of Real Estate and Urban Land Economics. And Alfonso Morales is Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor in Food Systems, Marketplaces, and Public Policy. So we've got a great group of experts tonight, looking forward to a terrific show. And leading us off is going to be Dean Paul Robbins of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, a world leader in addressing global environmental change. Dean Robbins is leading new initiatives in education, such as the establishment of a professional master's degree in environmental conservation, and he oversees a rapidly growing undergraduate environmental studies program. He has years of experience as, as a researcher and educator, specializing in human interactions with nature and the politics of natural resource management. His research addresses questions spanning conservation conflicts, urban ecology, and environment and health interactions. Paul received his BA from UW-Madison and his master's and PhD from Clark University, and thankfully found his way back home. So Paul, great to see you. Uh, welcome to 2021. Happy New Year. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Take it Thank away. You, Mike. Happy to be here. Actually, I'm not from here. I'm from Colorado. I knew that the best uh, university in the country was the University of Wisconsin-Madison, even when I was 16. So uh, I'm glad to be back. Um, I want to talk briefly about uh, the pandemic, but mostly about the lessons that it teaches us. Um, I've learned a lot. It's been a terrible year for a lot of people. A lot of people have been sick. I know people have been sick. Um, but I have had, there is, there is a silver lining to the cloud, and I think many urban ecologists think about it this way, is that we had a chance to sit down and look out the window for nine months. I've been looking out this window that you cannot see for nine months, and I've watched the seasons change. I've watched the wild turkeys roll by. Um, I've looked at the air quality. I've had a chance to think a little bit about how our transportation system works. And I'm not alone. A lot of great UW scholars are doing just that. So what I wanna present are some lessons that we might draw from this horrible lockdown that we've been in about urban ecologies and maybe about how cities in the future could be uh, greener, more livable, uh, more joyful than the cities that came before. Are there opportunities, in other words, in what I'm calling the anthropos? That's a fancy word for saying, in a world where people, anthro, control biogeochemical systems, the climate system, the ecological systems that support biodiversity. We have, a, we have a very heavy hand on the earth, human beings. What would happen if for nine months that hand even lightened a little bit? Took a pause, an anthropause. So I'll give you some examples and some thoughts from cities and I can take more um, conversation in the questions. So the anthropause, that break, of human weight on the land was really felt in cities in a big way. Uh, Madison's a minor example. Um, I had friends locked down in New York City. Fascinating, right? What I mean here is a very temporary reduction, very temporary, nine months, a year, a year and a half, of human influence on environment and systems. I'm going to give you three examples from cities. There's countless others, but they just have to be places that come to the top of my mind, seem the most important, and we have got such good expertise at UW-Madison to kind of back it up. One we experience significant improvements in air quality around the world. I mean, everywhere, not just in the United States. In India, where I've worked my whole career, Delhi, you could see the sky. I don't remember the last time that was true. Uh, second, I wanna talk about the large scale transformation of transport systems and patterns that cause that and that are tied to a lot of other benefits to potential future cities. And third, I wanna talk about the reappearance of urban wildlife. Critters seem to be everywhere. Is this zoopolis, that is, cities where all of us live together with other animals? Probably not, but there is a hint in the anthropos about that. So I'm going to hit all three of those very briefly. 
let's go ahead. So first, air quality. Nitrogen dioxide is a great index for bad air. We've been working in the United States on nitrogen dioxide since the Clean Air Act, right? We've been working on this for decades and we've done a very good job driving it down through improved technology, um, cooperation between industry and regulators, uh, changes in people's habits, what things are going on. We've done a good job, but it still is a vexing problem. The air is still not great. And then <laughs> between January and April of this year, there was a 25% reduction in nitrogen dioxide. That's huge. That's bigger than you can get from any regulatory uh, intervention that you could possibly imagine. What you see on the left are some visualizations from NASA. But we're talking about a really radical change in air quality. Uh, now, we got them at an expense that's too expensive. The US economy shrank by 30% on an annual rate basis between April and June, basically the same period. That's obviously not what we're looking for. But it is amazing how quickly cities responded, in a sense, to how air responded to changes in cities. So if you change cities, you could change the quality of life, change the quality of the environment. Bring back birds. We've lost one third of bird life in this in North America since 1970. So can we decouple those? I think so. And I think the anthropos gave us a lesson about how quickly change can occur. And it's not just here in the US. Um, next slide would be China. This is just between January and February in 2020. Nitrogen dioxide levels and density uh, on a square meter basis. I mean, China, for any of you who, who live there right now or who have been there, is a beautiful country. But the, the air quality is a challenge. And it's something that the party knows about. And it's something that people who live there know about. Bang. Um, the incredible contraction of the economy notwithstanding, the air responded. There's reason to think that there's ways to do this in the future that aren't destructive to human livelihoods, welfare, and especially on the hardest and most marginalized people. So that's one. Two, how did it happen? Well, one of the main things, it wasn't energy reductions, which is one of the main places where nitrogen dioxide comes from, burning coal, for example. Um, it, it came from transportation. A lot of it came from transportation. The roads emptied of cars. People, bicycling became an enormous part of the urban landscape. Whole lanes that had been given over to vehicles previously, that is automated vehicles, were given away to pedal powered vehicles all over the country and all around the world. This is uh, from Paris. These were busy streets. I know that road. Uh, it usually isn't full abreast with bicycles. You couldn't find a bicycle in New York City in April of 2020. Slide. Now, part of that is people getting out of cars. Uh, part of it is just an overall reduction in people's transport. I've been sitting in my basement uh, through a lot of the last year, um, but it's been a boom for bicycling, no matter how you measure it. And you see bicycling rates going up uh, in Houston, Washington, DC. This isn't some kind of blue red thing. This is a, a kind of global response. And that's good for people's health. It's good for uh, living in cities. It's an environmental transformation. Next slide. The problem that had to be confronted by cities, and this is the one that we face going forward, is how do you build an infrastructure for a different kind of way to live in the city? That's not just bikes, it's, it's walking, it's having sidewalk cafes where none existed before. Um, uh, people found that they liked it. It wasn't just about their health. It meant uh, uh, they improvised. Anything we can do on a short-term basis in the last six months by painting sidewalks, we can do moving forward for 10 or 20 years, 30 years. Fundamental trans transformation in transportation. Next slide. The trick is that I, I fear, and I'm not an expert here, and I would turn to transport um, uh, experts on this, is that some significant part of that increase in bike traffic came out of a decrease in public transit. Public transit, as you can see, between 2016 and 2020 didn't move that much. Pe people, Some people took buses and some people didn't. It's still a good ridership rate, but it didn't change much. And then, bang. Nobody wanted to get on a bus. Um, just as Tim's going to tell you, nobody wants to get on an elevator. Do we come back from that is a very, very important question for the future of the environment in cities. Next slide. Last piece, just to show you how quickly cities can change. This is uh, These are jackals in Haifa. These photos were taken within the last few, couple of months. Next slide. That cougar is in um, Santiago, Chile, downtown. Next slide. 
Uh, coyotes have always been ubiquitous. Coyotes are found in every county in the United States, including um, in New York City. Uh, but they sure came out, or seemed to, this year in droves. And finally, Milwaukee here. This didn't come from this photo does not come from this year, but there was plenty of uh, of sightings. So the question is, and this is my last question, and then I'll I'll, I'll cede the floor. Has has the anthropos actually encouraged lots more animals to occupy Zoopolis, the city? Uh, we don't know. It could just be that we're sitting by our windows and we see them more often. This comes from a study from Santiago, actually, where they tried to figure out, are, are endangered species actually coming back into the cities by our being quiet? Or are we just seeing them? And I, I'm going to close with this. It doesn't matter. It's probably both. That the future of the ecology of cities is both our seeing the animals that are all around us and making more space for them. I think Tim will probably have more to say on that question because in a sense, if commercial versus residential real estate shifts in the downtown, if there's a contraction or densification or de-densification, that's what's gonna produce like green space and the opportunity for us to live in and around wildlife. And those questions are really about political economy and not about ecology at all. But I do wanna leave you with this thought that what I've seen sitting in, out my window in the last nine to 12 months is that urban ecologies can be very different than how we knew them before. And they can get different very quickly. And that should cause us all a lot of hope. Those are my thoughts. As you noted, it's a shame it had to happen with that kind of contraction and economic output. And so we'll see what we can do to, uh, you know, What'll be interesting, Paul, is whether uh, the pandemic has gone on long enough to really change people's habits. Um, if it had been three month disruption, maybe not. But if this goes on much longer, you know, people have new ways of doing things. So it'll be interesting. Thank you. We'll get back to you with questions. Next up, we have Tim Timothy Ridio, who holds the Grass Camp Chair and is a professor in the Department of Real Estate and Urban Land Economics at the Wisconsin School of Business. He's best known for his work on credit risk and mortgage lending, mortgage securitization, real options, real estate investment trusts, and importantly to us, land use regulation. Ridio is past recipient of the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association Best Dissertation and Best Paper Awards, and is a fellow at the Homer Hoyt Institute for Advanced Studies and the Real Estate Research Institute. He's also former president of the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association. Tim is a three-time Badger grad, earning his BBA, master's, and PhD from the Wisconsin School of Business. All great choices. And uh, that is where I met Tim uh, back in 2002. And Tim, it's great to see you again. Um, you know, you're a great colleague and uh, great to have you on our segment tonight on cities. So take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Great to see you. Uh, for for those who uh, may not uh, know the deeper background with Mike, Mike was uh, came in as dean in 2002 of the Wisconsin School of Business and and did a fantastic job and was my boss for almost 10 years. So it's uh, it's great to see you, Mike, uh, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, I guess the future of cities. It's a it's a big topic. Um, uh, uh, let me try alliteration on a title for my for my talk, which, by the way, first time I'm going to give a talk without uh, PowerPoint slides in in uh, as long as I can remember. Uh, can COVID can the COVID nineteen curveball be corralled? It's a terrible title. I'm not even going to really talk about it, but in that sense. But uh, um, uh, let's talk about cities and COVID. So I'm going to I'm just going to make four four points, hopefully fairly quickly. Um, and my first point is is that uh, COVID is is a losing proposition. It's 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 had um, huge costs uh, for humans, uh, uh, for everybody across the entire globe. Um, however, it's um, it's really a story of relative winners and losers. And um, so, when we think about cities, you can there's a whole continuum of of how cities have done relative to one another. Uh, and um, uh, so let's just think about cities as um, as falling into the winner or loser category. Um, in the uh, clearly in the loser category is the older, denser cities, uh, mostly on the coasts, uh, and those cities that have high tax structures. Uh, New York City is the poster child of 
of, of a city uh, in the U.S. and indeed in the world that's gotten hammered by uh, uh, COVID. San Francisco even uh, is um, having a really tough time and they're gonna have a tough time for a while. Uh, Chicago near, uh, near us in Madison is uh, in the middle part of the country uh, and um, is, uh, is also uh, going to continue. It's, it's had some tough times and it's gonna continue to have some tough times. On the, on the, on the relative winter side are the less dense places, uh, places like uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Dallas, Texas, uh, and uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin would fall into that category as well. And it's, it's interesting, you know, it, uh, Las Vegas might, you might not think of as being a relative winner. The gaming industry has gotten hammered uh, by COVID, but, um, but there's an awful lot of people moving to Las Vegas uh, from California and other places. And uh, in 10 years, it's gonna have a very, very different economy, a more diversified economic base than it has, has now. Um, so, so, you know, the losing cities, what are you seeing? You're seeing people are moving away. Hotels for business and tourism um, have been de uh, devastated. Uh, work from home has uh, uh, hurt, uh, uh, hurt cities, uh, hurt the office space market, the property market. Uh, Paul mentioned we're going to, it, within cities, uh, uh, they're going to re remake themselves over the next 10 years. Uh, uh, while Mayor Bloomberg was uh, mayor of, May, uh, of New York City, 40% uh, of the properties uh, of the lots in New York City were subject to rezoning. Uh, and this was about from 2003 to 2015. We're gonna see the same thing happen in a very different way this time uh, in terms of how land use is going to be uh, uh, reused. New York's going to have to adopt um, and it's gonna be, it's, it is indeed going to be a less dense place at least for a while. Um, so that's really point number one is, is oh, I wanted to also say is, is work from home. Uh, the issue from work from home will persist, um, uh, which is bad news for um, places like New York City and a lot of places that depend on people um, coming into the city during the day. Um, the margin prior to the to COVID was maybe five to 10% of people in, in an hourly way work from home. Uh, and that's going to double, at least double, uh, post-COVID, even after people go back to work. Um, so the, the question is, we don't know what the what the numbers will be. There'll be uh, certain businesses where most people go back to work, other businesses where uh, people will stay remote. Uh, we'll see how things shake out. But what we do know is, is that the, there will be a, a, a lot more work from home permanently. It'll last uh, and it's going to have long lasting effects on, on properties. Um, my second point is, is that these high tax base, these relative, these coastal cities like New York and Chicago and San Francisco, um, uh, we're going to see some, they're, they're in tough shape. There's going to be some serious municipal financial crises. Um, what's going to happen are the, the cities are going to, the cities and the states are going to have to raise taxes um, to plug fiscal spending gaps. This is going to cause more people to move away uh, and it's going to be a, a bit of a, a vicious cycle. Um, an example that we're seeing right now uh, playing out is Tesla and uh, Elon Musk is uh, making uh, pretty serious noises about moving to Texas and uh, it may happen. Uh, I think California is going to be dealing with a lot of that sort of thing uh, over the next uh, few years. <clears throat> uh, uh, will, the, will the government bail out uh, these cities and states? And uh, it'll depend on the outcome of the Georgia Senate races that are uh, that are just finishing up. The voting's just finishing up now. Um, if the Senate stays Republican, uh, there's not probably not going to be big bailouts of cities and states. The Republicans, this has been playing out for the last couple of months in terms of the spending packages. Uh, most Republicans don't want funds going to states like Illinois and New York because they're afraid they're going to use that money and plug previous structural uh, uh, gaps and things like public pension plans, uh, which are underfunded. My third point is that uh, I believe COVID-19 uh, effects are going to linger longer than many people believe or hope uh, in cities. And, um, and here's why, uh, is that, and this hasn't been talked about very much, is, and it comes down to inequality and two forms of inequality uh, that that um, have been exacerbated uh, by COVID. And, and one is income and wealth, and the other one is racial. Um, this has resulted in greater urban unrest, 
and crime. And um, uh, we've got people in, in, in cities that are dealing with problems. And now you've got people who don't feel safe in cities. Um, and until and unless we uh, make serious inroads on these inequality issues, I think it's going to be a slow recovery, especially for these bigger, older cities. Um, one silver lining I wanted to mention is uh, buildings, is, is people want to work and, and live, work in greener buildings. Uh, and so we're going to see uh, better built and more environmentally friendly buildings going forward because consumers and uh, people who work in offices are in, in a much better bargaining position um, than they were before COVID to get those kinds of um, buildings built. And then my fourth and final point, which really isn't a, a city point as much as it is a higher education point, is, um, is that uh, what we've learned here at the University of Wisconsin uh, over the past uh, six, well, the fall semester, it hasn't even been six months. I think we've really learned a lot in the last four months um, after students came back to, uh, came back to campus. Um, is that is that undergraduates, uh, not not to mention graduate students who always want to be here face to face. Undergraduate students, uh, they want to be here and they want they want to be in Madison. They want to be in the classroom. Uh, they want to live on campus. Uh, they want to see their classmates. Uh, they want to engage socially. They want to go to sporting events. Um, so again, this is a story of uh, relative winners and losers. I think uh, we University of Wisconsin Madison. We're going to come out of this stronger um, and better than ever. Um, uh, and because of the things that we've done historically and because of the terrific leadership we've had uh, over the past nine months. Um, and uh, uh, so so it's a good news story for places like us. We've got a brand. We, we do things that just cannot be replicated um, other places. And, and it can't be replicated online uh, with online classes. <clears throat> However, uh, there will be some uh, big losers in its commodities, commoditization of uh, higher education, uh, where um, uh, the, the lower tier schools, the, the, some of the smaller state schools, the technical schools are going to have a tough time going forward because the difference between online education and the face-to-face -face education that they offered before perhaps won't be as big as it was. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And I want our audience to know it's not a requirement of the show that Tim compliments administrative leadership at UW-Madison. I think that's genuine. And I agree it with is. you. It there is. You go. No, and, and we do. I, I completely agree with your remarks on higher ed. Um, I think there is a shakeout coming, but I think Madison emerges from this stronger than ever because that fusion of research and education is uh, it's a powerful mix and it's an in-person experience. And, you know, we have the best piece of real estate in the Big Ten. Exactly. He doesn't want to be here, right? Yeah. Yes. In the world. Okay. Yeah. What, you're a real what estate a guy. Place. You would know. All right. So next up, we have Alfonso Morales, a Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor in Food Systems, Marketplaces, and Public Policy in the Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture in the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. Professor Morales is originally from New Mexico where his family has farmed and ranched for more than a hundred years. He's interested in applying science to support society. His research interests include social science theory and methods, organizations, food systems, public marketplaces, and street vendors. His applied research supports nonprofit organizations and he co-authored a toolkit for farmers market managers. Alfonso earned his undergraduate degree from New Mexico State master's degrees from the University of Chicago and University of Texas at Dallas, and his PhD from Northwestern. So he can judge what the best university is, and he's at it now. So <laughs> welcome, Alfonso. Uh, please uh, take the floor and uh, share your thoughts. Sure do appreciate the kind introduction, Mike. It's really a delight to be with you and to join Tim and Paul here. Uh, I want to wish everybody a good evening and happy new year. And uh, hopefully uh, you are looking forward to the future of cities as much as we are. So but to look, to cast our gaze forward, I want to cast it backward a little bit. Let's go back a few thousand years to the ancient Greeks who, who coined the term cosmopolitan to think about city life, right? They were thinking about, well, who is it that gets along in cities? 
cosmopolitan people do. The universal polis, right? Uh, uh, people who could navigate uh, differences of any kind in support of directing their attention to solving the problems of the of the cities, which were growing all the time. So, so city life is about navigating difference. It's about a vastly complicated division of labor through which relationships get formed, erode, re remake. It's this. It's this. Uh, it's this. It's 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 the stardust, you might say, out of which new stars are constantly being born, right? So we have, on the one hand, we have this idea of cosmopolitanism. On the other hand, we have a Chinese proverb that I'd like to share with you. It is that the scholar builds the cities and the woman knocks them down. Hmm. That, that somehow or other, uh, cities uh, are constantly exposed to disarray of different kinds. But one of the things that I want you to, to direct our attention to is that the opposite of both of these is increasingly the case, okay? First of all, we have to remember that modern cities of the last few hundred years are built on both politics and science, right? Citizen science in the sense that sanitation came from observation of cholera in London, right? Uh, but also uh, politics in the sense that in the absence of, of uh, authority, social order can break down, right? In the absence, in the absence of trust in fellow feeling, in, uh, we get the sort of difficulties that are reported in the newspapers that, that Tim is talking about right here. So uh, over time, historically, even though crime rates have decreased historically, uh, there, we're, we've experienced a bump in a variety of, of social problems in over the course of these last 10 months. Another thing, though, that cities are built on is diversity and difference, right? We know that diversity and difference make a great deal. Uh, they, they're the generators of economic activity in, in cities. Now, what I said, though, is that it's the opposite is the case. On the one hand, women are not knocking anything down. In the last 30 or 40 years, women are indeed transforming design, the STEM professions, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, the design professions, architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, uh, physical land use planning is being transformed by uh, women in, in their design and engineering firms in government, in business. They've infused cities with context sensitive thinking and care about scale and sustainability. It is in the presence of those folks, and this is in the presence of diverse uh, leadership that cities are, in my view, despite COVID, on the verge of, of a huge transformation in livability and agreeability and fostering uh, human, uh, human uh, uh, happiness and uh, human capabilities. So, however, the bad news is, is that folks are not so interested in cosmopolitanism, right? They're very much more skeptical of diversity. Uh, there's distrust of government, distrust of science, all of which disagreement about who matters and what matters. And in the presence of this disagreement, which are compounded by COVID, but have been foreseen, foreshadowed for decades, that those things compounded by COVID, there is still an opportunity that we're seeing in cities for, uh, for transformations that are in keeping not only with um, fostering uh, a, a COVID proof future, that is to say cities that are more resilient and responsive to natural disasters of various kinds, but also cities in which uh, human flourishing is truly uh, possible and achievable. So let me drill down to three examples uh, to, to, for you all to consider. The first example was with respect to food production, food production, distribution, and consumption. That's my first example. So historically, 100 years ago, Duluth, Minnesota was one of the 10 largest cities in the country. And one of the things that they needed the most was food close by, close to hand. They invited urban agriculture, as did cities around the country. They invited and formalized 
uh, street vending and marketplaces in order to foster the incorporation of immigrants uh, and of women into the workforce. Historically, food was not just produced in cities, but distributed in a variety of ways uniformly in order to foster access to healthy food. In COVID, what has happened? We've seen an enormous interest in regionalization. Farmers markets and community supported agriculture farms have, uh, have community supported agriculture farms have sold out, completely sold out. Uh, capacity that they thought they had last January, they increased it and sold it out here in Madison and in other places around the country. Likewise, farmers markets were very popular places to go. People saw them for what they are. An easy way to uh, make the typical food purchases that a person needs, but do it more safely than in the in, than inside a building, right? So uh, regionalization is a very important thing here. So when we think about scale, international and national trade is not going away, but regionalization is going to be more important. We're going to see that. We're going to see that also because of increasingly brittle supply chains and the need to care about labor at, on both ends of the food supply chains. Uh, supply chains uh, experienced a variety of difficulties in the last 10 months, and a lot of attention is going to uh, making those supply chains more resilient. So another thing is uh, consumption. Habits have changed, right? Our, our consumer habits have changed. Many people go to farmer's markets that didn't go before. Many people are using food delivery services that didn't do that before. It's just changing the nature of the labor force, but it's also food security. Due to the economic dislocations that we've experienced in the last 10 months, there's been enormous uh, need for more food security services, various government programs and other sources of food security to enable people to, to have basic sustenance that they need. Uh, that food security has many sources though. One of my favorite books that I give to graduate students to read is one that's common in the fourth grade curriculum, Seed Folks. It's a wonderful story about an urban garden in a large city and how it is an empty lot becomes a source of community building, increased trust, fostering relationships, uh, giving people skills, giving people things to argue about in a productive way, whose recipe for tomatillo salsa is better than whose. And, and so while our consumption habits have changed and food security has been a problem, there are increasingly interesting uh, efforts to make food locally grown um, important source of activity as well as uh, calories in people's lives. Now, of course, data and technology have, are very, very important in these, in, with regards to these ideas. So uh, 10 years ago, I was on the NBC Nightly News and said, no, it's going to be at least 10 years before we've got viable models of urban agriculture, of rooftop farming, of aquaponics. And sure enough, a year ago, uh, I met the author of this book, <laughs> Brooklyn Grange, that actually operate in Queens. But in any case, that's OK. Uh, the point being that, that more and more people are finding the multifunctional uh, uses of urban food production, of urban food distribution. So in terms of technology, I'm on a couple of grant proposals uh, not in urban planning or any of the social sciences, but one for an engineering research center and the other from computer science perspective to use big data to help understand food situations, uh, food, the supply, uh, production of food through precision agriculture, and it's more sustainable production through sequestering uh, carbon in soil. Uh, it was uh, relatively small in terms of the overall carbon footprint, but nonetheless an important uh, something to attend to, an important thing to attend to, as well as machine learning and data to help predict predictive analytics associated with uh, the food security needs in a population with respect to to, to uh, difficult problems, like, for instance, what is brought on to COVID. So that's my first big problem, my, my first point. COVID is changing the nature of food. It's changing the way we think about food and the uses of food. It's accelerating changes that were present in society. Second thing I want us to think about is how COVID is reminding us about the importance of face-to-face -face engagement. Like Paul, 
I love looking out at the turkeys wandering by. And I mean, I grew up in, in rural New Mexico. Uh, uh, my high school graduated class uh, was 30 kids and came from an area of about 500 square miles to get a 30 kid high school graduating class. Okay. So, so I, I love the outdoors. And, and I think the, 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 uh, the way that Paul put it, I totally get that. Uh, uh, I also believe that outdoors marketplaces, they're, you might say, an original place for people to meet. They were the original autonomous zone. Folks have probably heard about these autonomous zones where folks think that they can act outside the state and in freedom. And uh, they're intended uh to be supportive of human creativity marketplaces have been doing that for a thousand years plus they were they were established in many cities in medieval europe in order to suspend conflict and uh, permit people to trade in peace marketplaces are wicked opportunities they thread together many functions of society social economic political think about the dane county farmers market and the political voice that's exercised at that market sustainability concerns as well, public health. I think it's very important for us to remember that when we think about COVID, we think first of public health, but when we think about cities and when we think about food, we can also think about public health. Marketplaces are sources of, of, of they stimulate our imagination to help us consider not just the existing relationships that we have with each other, but to imagine what it's like to relate to people across difference that we don't otherwise pay attention to any longer in our typical uh, modes of consuming at the mall or whatnot. So uh, I think it's important to think uh, about marketplaces. Marketplaces, I think, I think another thing to think about uh, with respect to both food production, consumption, et cetera, and marketplaces themselves, we have to think about the third thing, which is regulation and law. And for that, I will turn to uh, one of the great UW law professors, uh, uh, Hurst, Willard Hurst, who wrote 75 years ago that the purpose of law is to release the creative energy of the population. And indeed, what I, when I write about policy and law for a variety of in a variety of places, what I'm focused on is how it is that we create ordinances and laws and policies that help release energy, that help release creativity and imagination of folks. And so it's very important to recognize that people are going to take initiative. They're going to try and find ways to uh, not just deal with the problems, but thrive in the face of whatever the problems are. That's going to change their habits. And those habits are going to come into conflict with the law. They're going to come into conflict with regulation. What matters most? The law here, regulation here, should our intent with it should be to release the creative energy of folks. Okay, and and there, how that happens is going to vary by jurisdiction. It's going to vary by scale and context. Right. Uh, however, the point is is that it it. It is happening, right? At the beginning of COVID, uh, I was among many other people who were bringing together uh, DACAP and Department of Health, uh, Health Services at the state level and trying to help them understand how it was to create guidance that would enable folks to continue to live in community and to foster community, but to do so in a safe way. So much more could be said about these different matters. However, I think it's important for me to, to turn uh, the, the microphone to the audience and to you, Mike. And again, I just want to say thanks for the kind invitation to join you all. And I look forward to our subsequent dialogue. Great. Well, thank you, Alfonso. Um, uh, lots to think about. Your, your, yours is the first talk that made me hungry. You talked a bit too much about food. Uh, however, I, I'm going to ask a question. So there's a lot of people that think we're on the cusp of the, the roaring 20s. Uh, a lot of consumption spending has been withheld by people who do still have the capacity to do that. And maybe when the COVID fog lifts, we'll just go back to normal with more cash. And that would be the roaring 20s, I guess. And 
And I also think there's another scenario, which is the boring 20s. We work from home. We all bought tel uh, Pelotons. I'm not going back to the gym. I'm not going to the yoga studio. I'm getting takeout food. We're doing more of our business on Zoom. Uh, no more business travel. And I'm watching sports on TV. Roaring 20s or boring 20s? Radio, which is it? Both. Okay. We're going to see Robins. some of each. We're going to see some of each. Robbins, which is it? Uh, boring 20s. I see travel reduction as an actual sustained practice. Morales. I agree. I, 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 think gonna, I, think be, I think it's going to be more boring. I mean, I, I, a non-scientific sample of folks that I interact with uh, are, are buying larger TVs and enjoying sports at home and don't see much reason except to go tailgate and then go home and watch the game. In the spirit uh, of the McLaughlin group, you're all wrong. Okay. Um, I can't be I, wrong. I was. I, 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 I know. I know. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, is wildlife an asset to urban regions or a liability? No, it's. I mean, they're delivering zoonotic disease. We share. That's where this. That's where this bug came from, my friend. We destroyed habitat. We destroyed rural habitat mowed down forests, exposed ourselves to animals, mixed them in markets, and now we're all sick. So, okay, so of course wait. wildlife are a liability. People are scared of wildlife. I've lived around elephants in India. They're not nice. They're not like it. They're at their zoo. But Zoopolis demands that, in fact, there are ways that we share the landscape with all kinds of different others. And if we're ready to share the landscape as a cosmopolitan space, with other humans, then I think we're ready to share it with things that don't bite. It's not the kind of wildlife I, I liked about San Francisco. Anyway, okay, <laughs> let's, let's get on to some great audience questions. Um, from Warren Nesbitt, is housing an antidote for commercial space? I believe remote workers will be here for a long time, maybe some reconfiguring of commercial into um, you know, residential is an option. Tim Radio, what do you think about that? Well, I guess it, it, um, uh, uh, are you, is there, are we thinking of, are we thinking of a place like New York City when we say that? Um, and, uh, I, I don't, and, and other dense places, uh, I don't know that that's going to happen. I think, I think commercials, uh, uh, P less people are going to want to live in these urban dense places, for, at least for a while. It's going to take it's going to take a while before people come back. Um, so, so I think that the and the, and people are moving to the suburbs. Um, now, one thing that is going to be true is that is that house prices in places like New York and uh, in places like New York City are going to go down, and that's the, and that's a good thing. Uh, they're going to be relatively more affordable than they were before. So there's going to be an equilibrium where you know where where you know you're going to get some people moving back into the city that that weren't there before. Um, uh, the question is is how much do prices have to fall before there'll be enough people to move in to yeah. eat up that commercial space that's going to that's that's becoming vacant. Uh, New York City has not just an office problem; they've got a hotel problem, and they've got a and they've got a, a bit of a retail problem as well. Although New York is a special place for retail, street retail. Um, the, the, it, it's, it, I don't know how places like New York yet are going to reconfigure themselves. It's a, it's a, it's, it really has, a, uh, I haven't seen that much written about it yet. And, uh, I don't think people really know. So Tim, you had talked about your expectation that work from home might roughly double. And I, I definitely agree with that. You know, uh, companies that I'm familiar with more intimately, in the financial services space certainly seem to be leaning toward much more flexibility with their workforce. Uh, there, you know, everyone's found that at least in those businesses, they can get as much work done. Uh, you know, the, the volume of activity in many of these businesses is exactly the same as it was before. And they're getting it done with people working from home and people like that. Uh, they'll, so they'll probably go to some hybrid model. People are in the office three days a week at home, two days a week something like that. Um, do you think commercial real estate prices 
around the country have already digested this or are are you thinking that's going to take some time and um there's still uh, space is still occupied right now right because it's leased out yeah uh no that's a great question and and uh, they're in the process, uh, you know, publicly traded real estate firms, you've already seen the impacts priced into the share prices. Um, and, and, uh, uh, but we haven't seen it yet uh, in terms of uh, kind of the real effects. Uh, uh, it's going to be another, it'll take another year before, uh, uh, you know, we really know what's going on in apartment markets and in office markets, I my my own sense is it's not going to be pretty. It's it, but it is going to depend on on what's going on politically. I just while we were um, uh, uh, while we were uh, talking previously, I, I I looked on my uh, phone and I see that we have two Democrats that are currently ahead in uh, in Georgia. Uh, if both Democrats get elected to the Senate, it's going to be a very it's going to be a very interesting. Um, dynamics in terms of um, how long aid keeps coming to the cities and, and keeps people in apartments without having to pay rent. So uh, it, uh, part of that adjustment process is going to depend on politics. But let me also make one other observation, which is that is that um, there's been a real uh, a clear division between winners and losers within commercial real estate. There's tech real estate which is real estate that doesn't have so much to do with people. Um, data centers, cell tower firms, um, uh, companies like that that, are, that have a real estate component to them, uh, warehouses, industrial property have, have done terrific. Their share prices have gone up, property markets have done well. They're not people-centric. The people-centric real estate, hotels, office buildings, malls, they've gotten killed. So, um, so keep that in mind as well, in terms of how things uh, shake out. The, 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 there's a real future, uh, different kinds of real estate are gonna be um, uh, emerging over the next 10, 15 years because of this. Question from James Rottenberg. Has the pandemic exacerbated the polarization among city, suburban, and rural tribes? I'll answer that, yes. <laughs> I'll answer that part. Um, if so, aside from politics, what are the implications for our society? And I don't know if maybe we'd start with Paul or Alfonso on that question. Sure. I, I'm going to accede to Alfonso because my answer would have to do with Stephen Lowry's comments about how good cities are for the earth. <laughs> However, how are the tribes do the math? The math on on climate impacts, efficiency of densification is unquestionable from an environmental point of view. We tend to think about the environment as pastoral. And I, you know, Alfonso comes from a ranch and I, resp I work with dairy people. I love the rural, but the sustainability of the earth system is gonna depend on cities. And the more we can kind of decrease that tribalism and understand our interdependencies, like that's the quicker we get out of this mess because the, what you described, Mike, is real. It scares the hell out of me. I don't like it. Yeah, I, I agree with Paul. I, fostering interaction is central here. Uh, fostering a sense of shared a fate is central here. Uh, you know, many of my ancestors served in the military. My sister was in the Peace Corps. I did a VISTA program here in the States. So a lot of folks, uh, had service and had in their imaginations what they were serving, right? A particular population as well as a larger population, uh, an idea even, right? Imagined community that we call the country, the United States or any other nation state. And in the absence of that sort of shared imagination, the, the presence of that shared imagination facilitates interaction, and I, and I would, I would, uh, I, I think that the that this is a real serious problem that experts here at the UW Madison are addressing. Myself, through the vehicle of marketplaces and trying to foster inclusivity in marketplaces, 
we worked with Bloomington, Indiana farmers market was on the front page of the New York Times for racism in the market last summer. We sat down and did some work on that. Uh, and, and I'll be doing that in class. So this, this spring. So I, I better stop there. But one of the things that we need to remember is that the less that we can have co-presence, the more that this will likely persist, at least in the short to medium run. And so for instance, uh, it's important to think about reconfiguring spaces to permit face-to-face -face interaction for some periods of time in order to socialize folks into the habits of that organization, whether it's a corporation or some other thing. That kind of harkens back to the previous question. However, it's still the, the, the case that for the next dozen or so years, face-to-face -face interaction is gonna be centrally important. One other thing I've, I think it's so super important to remember is that this is all going to happen again. In a few years, there will be another sort of COVID thing. It's the environmental studies, Paul could speak to this, right? The, I'm fortunate to be part of the Nelson faculty and I'm informed by our colleagues in the Nelson Institute that is without a question that a similar sort of thing is going to happen again. It's going to make the same sort of demands on society. We need to speak in, in about how we have overcome them now and prepare for the next one. Well, on that happy note, let's change gears. I, I want to get through this pandemic. Um, so it sounds like the boring 20s, uh, it is, uh, if we're going to hunker down again in five years. Uh, next question, Glenn Karlov wonders, how will less dense cities such as Madison, Ann Arbor, some of these classic college towns, how do they fare, Tim? You mentioned the bifurcation of uh, uh, how cities will fare in the future. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think they're going to do pretty well. They're, I mean, they're, uh, uh, they've always been attractive places to live. Um, you know, I think we, we've, we've just gone through an era where, where there's been the triumph of the city. There's a famous book by a Harvard professor at Glazer called Triumph of the City. Which is about New York, San Francisco, the big, the big, bigger, denser places, and we've we've just lived through that, and um, and now it's uh, it's I think what we're going to have for a while is the revenge of the suburbs and the less denser places, and and so I think uh, you know the look the amenities are great in places like Madison and Ann Arbor, um, and you can you know the folks that have had to spend. The last nine months in a in a 700 square foot or a thousand square foot apartment and uh, and and can't take advantage of amenities. People want you know people want some space now, uh, but they still want amenities and to be able to join uh, enjoy them. Uh, they want to be able to bike. Um, uh, and places like Madison and Ar Ann Arbor feel great uh, for that kind of pack. It's a great package right now. So I think it'll uh, we'll have a we'll have a nice run for a while. I have a question for Tim on that. So I, I can't disagree with that. So, but in terms of equity, in terms of what, I mean, you talk about suburbanization, I think of that as white flight. I think of that as like a total abandonment of the tax base. I think of that as violence against the African-American community and so on and so forth. Like how then do you imagine, because I do, I like what you're saying, um, a, dis, a, a spread out kind of urbanism that is one, energy efficient, because like what I said before, density is the secret to efficiency, and two, equity, so that it's not you over there and me over there. So right. they're two different questions, but they seem strangely linked to me, the ecology and the equity question. Thanks for the easy questions, Paul. Those are, those are you know, those are, those are the, the biggest questions out there. And, uh, um, you know, we've, uh, as I mentioned, I think you know the the inequality issues are huge and tough, and and uh, you know we as a country, uh, uh, in my opinion, haven't really we haven't uh, addressed them and uh, head on in any case. And um, uh, it goes to the last question about cities and suburbs and rural areas, and is it going to get worse? And and the answer is yeah. Is it going to be the Roaring Twenties or the or the boring 20s, it's gonna be both because those who can, have, can afford it, it'll roar for a while. Those who cannot and who are hunkering down cannot. Um, so the, the, the inequality issues are, in my mind, are 
are overwhelming, and I have, you know, I'm not the right person to ask about those. And what about the food piece, Alfonso? I just throw this same thing at you, like the way the food system works, food deserts and all that. Like, right. does Tim's vision? Does everybody get to eat well? Yeah, that's yeah. It's it's a really good question. Given that for the foreseeable future, while it's changing, controlled temperature agriculture is is growing in importance, right? But uh, still not everything. And so we're going to rely for a long time on people of color, especially migrant workers, other folks uh, in labor in across different points in the supply chain to make that food available to us in economically affordable ways because we we know that that uh that the percentage of food that while the cost of food has decreased the percentage of the food of the household budget that food can take hasn't decreased that much and it's gotten worse because real wages have declined over time so these inequalities are exacerbated uh now the the food as an amenity is become a selling point for lots of places around the country. Uh, housing with a farm associated with a big housing development. There's a big one here in Chicago. There are a variety of them uh, springing up around the country. But again, that doesn't get to equity, right? That does not address equity at all. Uh, it exacerbates it again. I don't have, so, I don't, you know, there, the, there, there may be regulatory approaches to this, but none of them I can imagine are going to, they're going to release a, more of a dangerous energy than a productive one. So uh, while we're on food, Mark Schmidt, uh, one of our audience members wonders, is the food mm -hmm. delivery business here to stay? And what do you make of ghost kitchens downtown? You know, one of the things that people speculate about in the roaring 20s is we're all going to be going out to eat you know in in six months and uh, i'm wondering well where are we actually going to go because there have been a lot of restaurant failures and it was always a risky business to go into a very high fraction of new restaurants don't make it and now even successful restaurants many of them got wiped out by this pandemic and so i don't expect people charging back into that space so um what what do you what do you think will happen with the restaurant industry and will it ramp back up quickly or will we be doing takeout for a long time what are your thoughts alfonso they're not going to be at the same scale and they're going to be different business models so it'll be much more co cooperative and shared use spaces of the sort that had been emergent and growing in different places that that's going to happen a lot more uh there's been there's always been opportunities to do various sorts of pop-up. We've seen that those trends over the years. I think that's gonna accelerate. And so I think that there'll be uh, different sorts of agreements laid out for shared use commercial kitchens. And I think that there's gonna be a lot more creativity in outdoor dining. I think that there's gonna, we're gonna see, uh, uh, I don't wanna say a renaissance, but there's gonna certainly be uh, uh, a, a huge growth and the exact form will it take will it look like the taco trucks right we remember roach coaches when we were all young men right but now that's you know the talk of the town right over the last 10 years so uh, more of that's going to happen in my view and, and the only thing i can get outside here is a snow cone <laughs> <laughs> um well look we're at the top of the hour um I think uh, what I'd like to do is just go around the horn and give each of you a chance for uh, one final thought you want to share with viewers about the future of cities or anything uh, that you'd like. And uh, we'll go in, in order as we did on the show. So I'll start with Paul and then Tim and Alfonso. So Paul, uh, any parting words for us tonight? Two things. One, there was a comment about how there are no women on this panel. I want to acknowledge that. Uh, it's very hard over Christmas to throw everybody together. We got Alfonso at the last minute. like so. But I think you'd have heard different kinds of voices. Women have been affected by this transition in these cities radically different than men, even in the same socioeconomic uh, strata. So 
acknowledged. And I think that's something we need to think about. Two, uh, seize every opportunity. Every crisis is an opportunity. I hate to say that. I, I have a friend who died from this disease. So it's not an opportunity, and yet it is. If there is an opening in the city for more green space, for more outdoor dining, for collaboration and cooperation, for reimagining the real estate market so that it is both profitable and generative of community, seize it. Don't leave any opportunity unturned. That's what I would say. Oh, and three, my grandfather owned an automat in Brooklyn, and that model could come back. Well, there we go. Tim Ridio, final thoughts. Uh, this, this has been great fun. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's great to see you put together a great program. Uh, uh, I love this place on Wisconsin. <laughs> Thank you. Alfonso. Uh, technology is going to matter a lot. And so we have to have interaction about how that technology is going to get deployed and for whom and uh, towards what ends and who will participate in it and who will not participate in it because the equity issues there are huge. And so we need just more interaction about lessons learned and stories told that increase resilience in, uh, among us uh, in our society across the differences between us so that we find a, an appropriate balance to prepare us for the next time around. Those are great insights. Yeah, a lot of people talk about the K-shaped recovery that we have. You know, there are just people and sectors that have really suffered and others that have actually thrived. And as Tim noted, that's true of cities as well. And uh, some of that's the, the interplay with industries and cities. So be interesting to see how this all plays out. Thank you for your thoughts this evening. It was great having all of you with us tonight. Uh, Paul, your, uh, your exception is noted. Uh, we try to do a good job of getting a great mix of people on the show. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you to our audience for being here this evening. If you'd like to view this segment again uh, or share it with friends and family, you can find it on the Wisconsin Alumni Association WAA YouTube channel. Uh, the UW Now will be back again next Tuesday, January 12th, where we wade into the fire. Uh, we'll have three UW experts discussing the future of politics and political parties. Can't wait for that. So thanks for being with us. Welcome to 2021. We're going to continue to deliver some great content for you. Thanks for your questions and participation on Wisconsin.